So, hello, yes, and welcome to Cinema Eclectica, uh, part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. We are the Geek Show's dedicated movie podcast. I'm Graham, and this week I've been joined by... By a Rob, hello. Hello there. And we had one of those films which we were really looking forward to when it was originally scheduled to come out sometime in the Devonian era of, uh, of Earth's history. It's so long ago. We get we get a lot of um, screeners for these things, and screeners yeah. never run out; they're just <laughs> no. there forever. But this one, I have to go back to Picture House Entertainment. So thank you, Picture House Entertainment, and say, please, can we have another copy, sir? Please, please. <laughs> yes. And yeah. Then, the the yeah. the bit of internet that it was originally stored on had rusted <laughs> during the time it took us. Yes. In case you haven't worked out, listeners, this was originally planned to be cinema release just before lockdown hit. It is now coming out at cinemas uh, today, I believe. It's Corkadi Corkada. It's got the... quite a complicated release, actually. I think it's in cinemas and it's on BFI player and it's also oh, getting a very quick turnaround on Blu ray. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, f- find it on literally whatever your chosen format is. Not like we know, listeners. You're just throwing it all at the at the wall at once. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's inescapable, which is mm. apt, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, shall we try to explain this one? <laughs> let's let's give it a good old college try. Well, it starts off. Um, oh, <laughs> here you go. Uh, a couple and their eight-year-old daughter are going on a retreat somewhere. It seems. Mm. And this wacky, so, so, so wacky, like, could be on a comedy show like, I don't know, uh, Lee Francis or, a, <laughs> I don't know, some a Bo Selector or something like that show. Quality production like that. Come yeah. out of nowhere. And uh, really, really disarming. Mm. But they have some food at this restaurant and the mum gets ill. Mm. And uh, we, we head to hospital with them. Should I mention what happens next or leave that open? I think it is it is fair to set up what happens next. It happens pretty early. Yeah, and they have a... They wake up in the morning, you know, it's the daughter's birthday. They have, like, this toy that she's being... Assuming it's a toy, it's like a wrapped present that she's been clutching before this. Yeah. And they can't wake her up. And apparently she died in her sleep. And fast forward, um, we don't know how long... And mm. the husband and wife are going on a camping holiday. Yeah. A camping holiday in a part of the woods which has a oof, sort of person who'd be a snake oil salesman in a western. Mm. A Good woman with sort of lank black hair. Mm. And a man mountain with a monobrow. Yes. And things keep on happening, and they seem to keep on dying, and then waking up, and the same thing happens over and over again. I think the moral of this is, do not book your camping holiday in the woods from the evil dead. <laughs> yes. And also, camping sites are good, you know, don't just... <laughs> yes! I mean, I think at one... I can't remember the name of the, the guy, but he says at one point, all you need is a flat bit of land. No. Yeah, there's a bit more to it than that, yeah. A flat bit of land and a non-haunted stretch of woodland. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know what I expect going into this, because it's one of these films that I heard about first. I think it played the London Film Festival at the back end of last year. Mm, yeah. And it got a lot of acclaim and a lot of confusion. Which I get, because... It's interesting. One thing that appeals to, to me about it is that while it does have dialogue, it's quite spare and almost none of that dialogue is expositional. You have to piece together what's happening based on what you're observing rather than someone sitting you down. I hate using this as a term, but it has a quite uh, a social realist reality to it when it's in the scenes between. Oh, horrific torment. <laughs> yes. But the thing, that other, the other thing that's sort of um, it's been picked out by people is the fact that it's got a song, mm. which will get stuck in your head. 
Yeah, because I was worried with the title being Kulkadi Kulkadar, thinking, am I going to have that Beatles song stuck in my head all the time that I'm <laughs> watching this? And no, fortunately, there is an earworm of equivalent strength within yeah. this movie. It's Coco, 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 D, Coco, Da, Coco, D, Coco, Da, just over and over and over uh... again. <laughs> it's... It's, it's got like a music box aesthetic to it as well, which is really sort mm. of. It's actually eerie, though. I mean, how many times I've watched a horror movie and they think, oh, kids are singing equals scary. Yes. <laughs> and it's pretty shallow, let's be perfectly honest. I think uh, another thing that I really liked about this film is that a lot of horror movies now try and exploit the fears of childhood, but in a way that feels more like adults remembering things mm. that are scary from childhood. You look at the average scary clown in a horror movie and it looks nothing like an actual clown by now. It's almost like a sort of monster design all of itself. I mean, it is the classic example. Uh, mm. In the old ones from the 90s, that was a clown. Yes, yeah. I don't know what the hell they are now in the um, the Bill Skarsgård version. Yeah, I generally think that most clowns I've seen in the wild, as it were, avoid having, you know, an eyeliner that goes upwards to make it look like they're leering at you. I think that is mm. generally a bad idea in the clowning <laughs> fraternity. Yeah, you know, circuses wouldn't be invited back to town if they were started doing that sort of, yes. <laughs> sort of stuff. But another aspect of it that I really liked is it's not quite strict in the form that it takes yeah i talk a lot about uh how korean movies sort of pogo around styles and themes mm. but as i mentioned at, at the top it has this really really broad comic couple which totally took me by surprise i don't really know how to describe them yeah and uh, i think pat one of the things that i would say about them is that, again, going back to that childhood aspect, they are what adults look like when you're a child. Mm. They are people who are just doing this bizarre stuff for no reason you can understand. And even though the film isn't done from a child's perspective, even though the child character dies very soon after that, there is a sort of attitude that stays within the film from it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether I've been conditioned by a certain horror movies, but honestly, I thought they'd they'd been up to something. <laughs> I thought if they'd done something, it's kind of it's not really like the witch, but it's like at the beginning of the witch where it sets up the fact that this family are bad guys and doesn't do anything with it. And I thought, but but the bad guys have been kicked out of town. I don't understand what's happening here. Yeah, it's like, it's like yeah. a weird um, red herring that they just mm. sort of throw out there. Which I think is fine. But the other thing I was going to bring up is the little animated segments. Yeah. Which have a sort of Don Hertzfeld. Don Hertzfeld? I don't know how you say Hertzfeld. his name. Hertzfeld, yeah, yeah. Have sort of a, a sort of hand drawn DIY cut out effect to them. They're very lovely, yeah. They have an allegorical reference to the film, but I think they are so easy to enjoy on their own merits. And I think that's that's part of what makes it more than s sort of this... I hate this phrase so much, and I, I only use it because it's so useful at dismissing a certain kind of horror movie that actually markets itself as this, but elevated horror. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> it, I know how much you hate that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I actually like some of the films that have been tagged with that sort of brush like I, I'm a big defender of Luca Guadagino's Spiria remake but I think there is a level of pleasure in the genre mechanics in his version of Suspiria that yeah. isn't there in something like say Midsummer. With a lot of elevated horror law it seems like they believe themselves to be better than horror to be above horror yeah, and I didn't it. get that vibe from Cockadee Cockada oh, no. at all. Same yeah. with Suspiria. I mean, Suspiria is one of those movies where the more I think about it, the more I think I might actually genuinely like it. It just mm. grows upon you like that. But when you get uh, people like, uh, I can't remember his name, it's just, it's just vetoed in my head, void in my head. <laughs> uh, Hereditary, Midsummer. Uh, Ariaster. There we go. He always feels like he's trying to be above horror. Um, 
Well, I kept thinking of Aviasta because the setup, the loss of the child, is obviously the kind of thing mm. that he's drawn towards. And I never get the sense in any of his films that he's really exploring grief on any other level than here is something I can put in Act One that will show that I am a big, serious man. Yeah. And I think what Corkadi Corkadar has is that, firstly, it's not as poor faced and not as serious as Astor's films. But also, despite that, it does explore grief in a more in-depth and emotional way. Yeah, I've mean, re- uh, heard readings of it, readings which I agree, which is um, sort of a, a cycle of self-destructive abuse, mm. emotional Completely. abuse. Completely, yeah. And I've heard lots of criticisms of it saying that, well, it's it's just too miser- it's miserable, it's grim, it's just torturing these mm. people and you don't feel anything positive from That's kind of the point yeah and, and I, also... I, don't, I don't mean that in a way where it can basically do whatever and it doesn't matter because that's what the director was intending but yeah you know it, it it's trying to say something about you know guilt guilt and grieving i never got the sense that nyholm sees these people as kind of just sort of straw men to kick around i always got a sense that even when they were being tormented in some quite hideous ways, you were meant to empathise with them. You weren't meant to think of the figures who beset them as kind of Freddy Krueger-style fun horror movie villains who, you know, you're meant to sneakily like. No, they're they're horrible and they're doing awful things to people you care for. Yeah, I mean, uh, you look at the uh, Freddy Krueger thing and they just Mm. meet puppets to whatever happened to them. Yeah. Um. There was a scene in this in which uh, the man, the husband, escapes to yeah. the car, and I genuinely felt myself. I, I don't have any curtains, so I can't really do that sort of um thing. But I felt that sensation of peeking through the curtains, like you didn't want to be seen. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't think many things really get that sort of vibe anymore. No, I think that's very true. Yeah, I think it has a, a level of suspense and a level of the the kind of horrible quality of what happens to them is indulged without it being a sort of one note exercise in dragging likeable characters through the mud i never and i didn't watch it and think what's this guy doing what's his game i didn't watch it and think nihil must be a jerk to make this yeah i mean Which i'll be, I'll be honest though sometimes. i mean it has been described as a black comedy and if this is black comedy mm. i think sweden just genuinely needs something nice to happen to it <laughs> it's it's that sort of near the arctic circle weather it doesn't do anyone any good yeah <laughs> yeah but <laughs> it's um how can i put this uh it's not alienating in a way which some horror movies are. You know, when you you, mm. you talk about misery and this cycle of violence that keeps on uh, hitting these people, you could reference yeah. all sorts of things. And genuinely, it has this level of horrific graphic um, violence and gore. You, you mm. could bring up sort of French extremism, which, I'll be honest, I mean, I'm a pretty seasoned horror fan, but I've stayed away from that because of its reputation for quite extreme violence. Yeah, I've seen a couple of those films, and yeah, you have to be in the mood, let's say. Oh, oh yeah, I, I don't doubt that. But the way some people have talked about Coco de Coco da, you'd mm. think it'd be cut from the same cloth. Yes, whereas... There's there's not even much blood, is there, um, even on that level? Yeah, not really. I mean, there's a tent which it all kind of takes around, uh, centres on. The, mm. the, snake, so, uh, the snake salesman, the snake oil salesman, he basically cuts the strings of the, the rope and then, mm. I won't describe it because it is pretty horrible. <laughs> so, yeah, But yeah. It, it all takes place underneath this uh, sheaf that the, the tent is, you know. Yes. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, that that's part of why I felt like I trusted him. And another part is I cottoned on to the metaphor of the cycle of grief fairly early. Mm. And I think that 
gave me a sense of where the quote-unquote exit strategy of the film was. I knew what I was rooting for these people to do. I was rooting for them to break this cycle and get out of the loop. Yeah. And that felt like it gave me something to work towards, where I was, I mean, I'm sorry to bring it up again, but in Midsummer, I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to want these people to do other than go away and stop wasting my time. <laughs> yeah, it's... It re really, two and a half hours long, and there's a three hour cut, isn't there? I've heard. Oh God, yeah, there is. This is less than half of the length of Ari Aster's director's cut, yeah. and it packs so much more in. I will say this: I think in the age that we are in, we have to give these things called content warnings. Mm, and if you yes. like dogs, yeah, uh, maybe give it a bit of a consideration before you you check it out. I think. You know, I like dogs, but I did not like that dog. I think there's about two or three dogs. They're all the same breed, but they're all horrible little monsters. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they really have. Yeah, I, I think there is a, a degree of insight in it that balances it out. I love the idea that what is tormenting these people is not so much a fear from their childhood, but something which they associate with their lost child. It's like, you know that old Lon Chaney quote where he said, there's nothing funny about a clown after midnight? Uh, Lon Chaney, yeah, he... Yeah. Amazing actor, yeah. He has a good comparison there, because he does some horrible clown mm. m- movies, so, you know, he knows what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But that that is the thing, uh, These people are confronted with something that has happy childhood associations in a context where it can't do anything other than remind them that they've lost their child. And I think there's a kind of maturity to that that you don't get just trawling childhood fears for the sake of trawling childhood fears. Mm. It's like... I had a fair enough childhood, so all of this soft stuff about how, oh, the darkest things are like the dolls in the nursery just made me think, what the hell sort of nursery did you have? I mean, my only childhood fear was the one time I had a really vivid memory, a dream, sorry. I remember this day of going to a local community bakery and being baked into a pie. I don't know why I remember that dream, but it's there. (laughs) <laughs> oh man, if we're sharing childhood nightmares, I had the meanest one ever that I always remember vividly. Uh, I was picking toys out of a pile with my mum, but I had these mittens on and I just couldn't get hold of the toy that I wanted. So my mum just turned around and left me and the guy who owned the toy shop said, you're my son now. <laughs> you were, that's mean. <laughs> Where did that come from? That's a main subconscious that you've got there as a child. <laughs> but it's that sort of thing, isn't it? It's that. I suppose it's about crediting chi- children and childhood as a phenomenon with some intelligence. Mm. It's like it, they have some understanding of adulthood. Their life isn't just sort of toy boxes and dolls. There is an understanding of loss and fear and death in there that yeah. I think not enough childhood-based horror really gets to that truth, but this does. And there's a degree of ambiguity to it. I mean, it doesn't outright suggest that it's supernatural, although there mm-hmm. is overtones mm-hmm. that it might be. It might be something else entirely. It doesn't really plant its flag in any sort of idea, really. Yeah. And it keeps it quite fresh, I think. Um, reminds me of um, another uh, Swedish. It might not have been a debut. No, it's not a debut. Uh, Rob- Ruben Ostlund's uh, Force Majeure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's that sort of uh, acknowledging of guilt through mm. weird things that only happen in, in Scandinavian countries. Which. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think your point about it not being fully paranormal and not being fully psychological is something that I do enjoy in a lot of horror movies. Things like The Babadook and The Witch and Under the Shadow are all very careful to leave space for a rationalist explanation. And if you you wanted to say that Corkody Corkodar was just two people trapped in a kind of foliage, then 
the film works, but it also could be a supernatural threat, which is great. It has the animated segments have a, a doff of the cap to the supernatural, mm. I think. Yes. And that keeps it sort of uh, ambiguous, I think, yeah. Good cast too, a cast I was not familiar with. I understand Leif Edland, the guy in the white suit, is a real Danish music star, which is kind of wonderful. It, kind of, it reminds me of um, Phantom of the Paradise, in which the Faustian devil is played by the guy who wrote the Muppet song. <laughs> How have I got through my life without hearing that bit of trivia? <laughs> it's pro- Andy Williams, I think his name is, yeah. Right. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, I think they're all really committed and they get exactly the right, just slightly bigger than life level that this should be pitched on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand why people haven't liked it, but at the same time, Mm. um, I think that's a issue sort of widespread with Scandinavian movies. They have a very... Headspace that you really have to get into. I don't think yeah. you can force that really because uh, whether it's Ingmar Bergman, Roy Anderson, Liss, whatever, it's mm. quite uh, suffocatingly grim when it chooses to be. I think it comes from having so many alcoholic detectives. All of them, yeah. If Sweden, <laughs> if Sweden just had fewer detectives with a drinking problem, they'd probably be a lot more relaxed about things. But- at the same time, I think that gives it a nice sense of the other to it, really. It couldn't mm. really happen yeah. here, so I can kind of invest in it more than I would um, if it was uh, no, down the road or in some uh, Atlanta wood, which is seem to shoot everything these days. <laughs> yes. Although, having said that, I would absolutely watch a remake of Cockadee Cockada that was set in South Bank. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It'd be different. Imagine the horror. <laughs> It'd play differently, <laughs> but... <laughs> the dogs would be the same. Oh, oh yeah. There'd be more, more racism and the dogs would be the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any recommendations to go with this? Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Um, I, I don't think mm, Forest Majora would an... go well with it, but... Yeah. I don't know. It's just very singular, really. It's one of those films where you can either compare it to nothing or compare it to everything. Hmm. For some reason, I don't know why this happened, but Bed Sitting Room just popped into my head. They are both pretty sui genre. Yeah, I don't know how. You could probably, if I put my mind to it, I could probably fabricate a connection there. Mm. Uh, Bed Sitting Room is a adaptation of a Spike Milligan play as a 1960s sort of surrealist comedy with everybody. You just yes. everybody in it. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. It's funny you should bring it up, actually, because I was also thinking of a movie with Peter Cook, uh, Pete, well, Peter Cook in it, at least. Mm. Uh, the Jonathan Miller version of Alice in Wonderland. I've seen that. Which I, th- I think we've discussed on this show before. It's the one where... Rather than have everyone in like elaborate animal costumes, they just have everyone in dinner jackets insisting that they're actually a turtle or a mouse or whatever. <sighs> and it's a very trippy film, but it does have that kind of child's eye view of the adult world quality. Mm. You suddenly realise how many of Cavill's characters are just people doing jobs and how baffling... Alice finds the idea of a footman or something like that. I mean, it, it's it's difficult to wrap your head around, really. Coco de Coco da, and I've said it before how that's the sort of thing I kind of uh, strive for when I'm looking for movies. Something you haven't seen, something before, fresh. Yeah. I mean, I've seen so many biopics. I've seen so many everyday horror movies, character dramas, mm. and you feel like you've seen them before you've seen them. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing like that in Coco de Coco da. It's quite mean spirited, but it's mean spirited with a point and it's very, very of its own, of its own, cut from its own cloth. So, if you've enjoyed what you're listening to and you want to hear us keep reviewing Swedish bereavement movies, you can help out in a number of ways. Simplest thing is you could just tell a friend to listen. 
and you know give us one extra listener but if you fancied something a bit more elaborate that perhaps took a bit of writing skill yes I, I credit you with writing skill listener you could write a review and that will help us with visibility or you can donate to our patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the geek show you can find us on social media to wit twitter facebook and instagram at tgs underscore the geek show well i may be hungry but there's always time for the geek show unsure if your spider-man is amazing or spectacular infinitely confused by crisis on infinite earths or does the mere thought of x-men continuity make you tremble then four panel is the podcast for you join me andrew and my co-host robin mick as we guide you through the weird and wild world of comics We'll talk about the secret origins of your favourite characters, delve into the craziest events of comics past, and review the hottest new graphic novels that you might have missed. That's Four Panel, a part of the Geek Show Podcast Network, available wherever podcasts are found. So if you do go on to thegeekshow.co.uk, you can find some written reviews of films that we are not doing on the show. Like, I believe, Rob, you've just got one come on today. Yes, um, the new one from Third Window. Mm-hmm. So that was Third Window, Second Window, Second Run, Second Sight. There's lots of weird, confusing things. I get confused with them all. never get up to number four, do no. they? Um, no. This one is a very, very small Japanese budget um Stop me if you've heard this story before, right? Mm. It's about a shy guy from Talking Versity Meets a cute girl. Cute girl tells him to work at the bath house, and the bath house turns to be a front for Yakuza murders. <laughs> okay, there's a point at which that took a turn. Yeah, it's that it's that classic meet cute in romantic comedies. <laughs> That sounds great. Um, I've also got a review up for a film that's out at the cinemas. Yes, that's we're getting back underway with that. Those things. Whew. Them things. Uh, out at the cinemas this Friday, actually. It's called Real. It's a new British romance with uh, Aki Omoshabi, uh, who write, co-writes, directs and stars, and Pippa Bennett Warner, who is really, really, really good in this, I think. Hmm, excellent. Yeah. It's nice to see like working class British cinema which isn't basically war is me constantly. Yeah, I thought so. And I, I think the film is at its best when it's breeziest. It's like, yeah, we know the characters don't have two pence to rub together, but most people ah, who are in that situation have bits of the day where they're not thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds in- it real, was that? Real, hmm. yeah, that's that's what that's called. Impossible to Google, so well done then. Uh, yeah, we spoke about this, didn't we? Uh, film has yet to catch up with music in terms of the revolution of misspelled band names to make it easier to Google. Yeah, there's no Chiverches. Uh, Chiverches, ch- or Wavathers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> missing a beat there, cinema. You're missing a beat. So, uh, we had a question of the week, which, I mean, we've got a pretty confusing film of the week this week. We had a very confusing film of the week last week, so we felt like we had to ask, which film most confused you? (laughs) Yes. I got a few answers on Facebook. Uh, Chris Common Swings said, Primer, couldn't follow it at all. With movies like that, you don't know whether it's intentional or not, though, don't you? It's... Big shout out to, I think it was H Bomber Guy who said on Twitter once that if you watch Primer and then you watch it again straight afterwards, you've wasted twice as much of your time. It's a spot on. Yeah. I mean, I've watched yes. it once and I think that's as much time as I want to give uh, the guy whose name has completely gone out of my head. I don't think it deserves Shane Carruth, who yeah. recently outed himself as an absolute dick on Twitter. So that was, uh, it at least means that I'm not going to have to suffer more. American film critics telling me he's a genius. It's one of those things where, you know, we said it before, if somebody turned out to be a horrible person, you'd be absolutely gutted. I mean, I I went for Jeff Goldblum. Mm. Whereas the opposite is, <laughs> you find out he's a bit of a, an ass. You think, oh, yeah. I think Shane Carruth is probably on that list. Yeah. Uh, Ian Payne says, warning, some of this might be contentious. <laughs> Interstellar. 
I couldn't understand how someone could sit through this pseudo-science fiction tosh without coming out and saying, what a load of pseudo-science fiction tosh. At least tennis had car chases. Well, I had a car chase, sort of. Yeah, a good one. Which is also going backwards at the same time. It was hard to follow. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Mikey Toes says, on on a similar note, Inception, and Honorary mentions to the infamous Under the Skin and The Turning. Do you remember The Turning from earlier this year, Rob? Yeah, but it's one of those... Wasn't there... I've been going back through a lot of the archive of the website. There was also a movie Mm. called The Turning, which I think was a collection of shorts from Australian directors. It was, yeah. The turning from this year was a version of The Turn of the Screw, which had been retitled to make it harder to remember what it was. Classic. See also real. Classic marketing strategy. Yeah. But it's interesting because it was directed by Floria Sigismondi, who I think is a promising director. Uh, it stars Mackenzie Davis, who I think is a promising actor. And apparently it's a total mess that just ends like someone lost a reel. That's surprisingly common recently, how there's no mm. there's no climax to a movie, so it just feels unfinished. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't know what it is. Is it producers are getting more snip happy? I don't know. Well, money, there's all sorts of reasons it could be. Yeah. Um. Is that it or my turn? That's all I've got on Facebook, yes. On Twitter, Andrew Young of uh, Adjacent Parish but also occasionally Mm. of this one, said, uh, not sure if it's the most confusing, but Inherent Vice is probably the most I've enjoyed being deliberately confused by a film. Good call, good call. Was that confusing? I just remember loving it, I'll be honest. It's got a very, very naughty plot, uh, but, you know, it's a film noir with a stoner hero, so it's, it's, how could it not? Kind of on brand, yeah. Actually, there is, an, there is another answer on Facebook that I've missed, which is great, and we should say Mick Snowden, uh, sometimes of this parish, says, Mother! Confused by its name, how it got greenlit, why it existed, not as confused as Jennifer Lawrence seemed to be in most of it, but confused nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a, a, a line of career trajectory between pre- Mother Lawrence and post Mother Lawrence. Pre Mother Lawrence was like, yeah, she's a superstar, one of the biggest new actors in the world. Post Mother, kind of, meh. Yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> post Mother Lawrence, you look at her and you think, oh, you poor dear. <laughs> you, you've survived Mother. <laughs> kind of tanked a career. I don't know if it's all to blame on Mother, but it's kind of a nice little uh, bit of pattern there. It's it's a shame because I think Jennifer Lawrence has now has an interesting brand as an actress, which is that she makes movies which are slightly nastier than you expect them to be. That's true, and that could be good if the movies were better. Uh, Andrew Young also goes on to say on Twitter, uh, "I also the obligatory. I was confused by people thinking Looper was good comment." <laughs> Second show in a row. Ashley Lane added, saying, uh, Alone in the Dark, nothing in it makes any sense when you relate it to any other part of the film. It's quite impressive, really. (laughs) Yes, it really is. Alone in the Dark is, uh, I think, Uwe Boll's second video game adaptation. It was early on in that real hot streak he had. Yeah, hot. That's that's how I'd describe that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, on Instagram, um, Steve oh, Sidhu one 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 said Inception, mm-hmm. Metal Amp Productions uh, added Donnie Darko. Yes, yeah, completely understand that. And uh, T underscore I I I A K E. I'm not going to try and pronounce it because it just sound like the internet connection's broken. Tiak. See, it sounds like there's a connection issue there. <laughs> <laughs> Said uh, Fire Tripper. It took at least two watches to get the timeline straight. I don't know what that is. Um, no, me neither. But we don't know our cinema. We're not we're all powerful, like, hive mind, mm. as much as we'd like to be. <laughs> We've got some answers from producer Rob, who's here. Uh, first one is Mind Game. I'm not. Um, if I got it right, it's a Masaki Yuasa 
anime, which is that, that. it makes a point of being kind of whacked out. That would explain why I don't know it. Uh, the rest of it I am familiar with. Uh, it's Waking Life by Richard Linklater. Yeah, not seen that one. That's quite a nice one. Uh, be warned, it is from that period where you seem to think that Alex Jones was a sort of cute Austin eccentric rather than someone who deserves to be beaten upside the head every day of his life. <laughs> uh, he says, Adaptation. Heavy Metal, which <laughs> part of me thinks you, you can probably understand what's going on in Heavy Metal just by rule of awesome. You just ask yourself, did the creators think this is awesome? Yes, okay, that's why it's in there. Well, it basically can be defined by two words, boobs and metal. I genuinely thought you were just going to say boobs there, like that counts as two words when you say it like that. Yeah, it's not. Pr- it's pronounced B, it's spelled B-E-W-B-S. <laughs> so... It was this. It was the seventies or eighties. That one. It's kind of a very much of its I think time. Very, very early eighties. Yes, definitely of its time. Um, that he then steals one of my answers with Synecdoche, New York. Spike Jones is popular on his list. Not that wasn't a Spike Jones one. That was uh, Charlie Kaufman going it his own way. <sighs> I thought there were just one sort of guest entity, but I, I guess I was wrong. It, it would be perfectly within character for one of them to have invented the other. Yes, it would. Indeed. Uh, he also says, Woo, an, uh, an anime here that I have seen, Paprika. Yeah, I think that's intentionally kind of a, a head mess around a row, that one. Completely. I mean, a, a week or two ago, I reviewed Inception, and I said I was one of the people who wished that it had been more like a dream. And then I saw Paprika and thought, Oh, yeah, that's what that would look like. <laughs> it's fantastic, though, don't get me wrong, but... Oh, God, yeah, yeah. completely. Uh, and finally, he says Naked Lunch, which, yeah, that is a bit of a head-scratcher. Hmm. One of the few uh, Lynch... Not Lynch, uh, Cronenbergs, I haven't seen that one. It probably works best if you like Burroughs. It, it is one of those adaptations that seems to have so much of the source author's personality in, even though it is a very unfaithful adaptation because, as Cronenberg put it, a faithful adaptation of, of William Burroughs' Naked Lunch would cost $400 million and be banned in every country that exists. <laughs> It'd be worth a go, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, around the table, uh, what have we got? Um, I've got a few... Uh, Kuso, I did on the show, and I still don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, that was the Flying Lotus yeah. dudes movie. Yeah, yeah. it's weird. Um, Fantastic Planet, which is a 1970s French sci-fi animation, which, again, I still don't know what that is. You know, it's about <laughs> droogs and arms, and it's just confusing. Yeah. Um, that that sounds pretty baffling. The other two, there's two ways to sort of be approaching uh, confusing movies. There's why is this so popular? I hate it, and why is this so yes. popular? I love it. Yeah, I think um, we we had a generous supply of both of those interpretations, didn't we? Indeed. Uh, the why is it so popular? I hate it. Is El Topo. Ah, right. Now, the only Hodorowsky I've seen, apart from that time when I took Peyote and saw his version of Dune, <laughs> uh, is The Holy Mountain, which I was going to mention as one of my answers. Yes, the reason I liked it. The reason why I picked El Topo, though, is it's famous for being like a midnight movie, isn't it? Mm, yeah. And my problem there is, if you put that out at midnight, half the crowd would end up asleep. Because it's just boring. I can't. I don't know if Holy Mountain is the same, but El Topo, yeah, it's like thirty minutes of an amazing acid western, and then it just kind of it had too much acid, and it needs just a bit of a sleep. <laughs> yes, thirty minutes of great acid western followed by an hour of come down western. Yes, that's a perfect uh, expression of that. And the, uh, it's confusing as hell. I love it. Is how so. Oh, God, yes, because, I mean, what on earth is any of that movie? I don't care, but I love it. <laughs> it's, 
One scene never, ever forget forgotten, sorry. Certainly, yes. I think, I mean, it might not sound it, but I'm a bit at a disadvantage here <laughs> in that some of my favourite films are films that absolutely wrong-footed me. I mean, I, I didn't know what daisies meant when I first saw it. I'm not wholly convinced I know what daisies means now, but I always enjoy going back to it. Yeah. Uh, similarly, I think I've mentioned this story on the show before, but I saw Mulholland Drive at a preview and I went home and emailed people I know with a message saying, I've just seen my new favourite film and I have no idea what it's about. Yeah, and it's one of the favourite moments on the podcast there, talking about that, because it's like a perfectly normal movie and then there's the club scene and then you just don't know what's happening anymore. <laughs> yes. At all. <laughs> I think in terms of pure confusion, Inland Empire is quite hard to beat. Hmm. Okay. I watched that again a couple of years back for a David Lynch rewatch project I was having around the time of the new Twin Peaks, and I feel like I can sort of see a few more of the ideas underpinning it, but I couldn't honestly tell you what every little bit is meant to represent. I don't think Lynch can, really. Um no, and I think, you know, that's fine. I think sometimes movies are meant to be a sensory pleasure, first and foremost. This isn't his background before he was a filmmaker as an artist, a photographer? As, as an abstract abstract painter and sculptor is how he started out. Yes, that, it all makes sense now. It, it all loops back around to that, you know. Yeah. The one where... I think I've I've had like quite hostile reaction and where my lack of understanding has impeded me is I did try and watch Eros Plus Massacre once. <laughs> yes, I saw your letterbox review of that one. So there's like a reel of bad soft porn and then a reel of like a videotaped Marxist lecture and then a reel of bad soft porn, then back to the lecture, then back to the porn. Why, why are people watching this? Why does this go on for like four hours? What's the purpose of this. Japan in the 60s was wild. It, oh yes indeed it was fun time. And you know we were reviewing uh, Funeral Parade of Roses a couple of weeks back and now I couldn't say that I understand every little bit of that but I certainly got a visceral thrill out of watching it and Eros Plus Massacre felt like I was watching two things that I found boring. Yeah, it's kind of like... Um, with added confusion. One that I've done on the show as well, uh, Seijun Suzuki's The Guy of Eisen. Oh, yeah, that sounded tricky. A movie which I don't think he actually was having any great effort to have a plot or coherence. He was just, here's a lot of things with a very, very thin, consistent thread throughout it. Beyond that, it's just, here's mm. some stuff. Just stuff. Yes, basically. Stuff which is really weird and one of the characters wants to have the bones of the other character and that was always... Okay. <laughs> you sort of watch that and you think, is, is that an innuendo that I've missed or is it literal? No, it was entirely literal. He wanted his bones. <laughs> <laughs> Right, shall we just go straight into Vitalina Varela of as much as oh, this right. thing can be entered? Um, yes, so I've got a film to review now. Um, mm. New film from Second Run. Exciting. Which, if you're a first-time listener, long-term theme of the show is we're fans of the things they do at uh, Second Run. Mm. Highlight things that wouldn't get highlighted otherwise. And there's a bit of a breaking of a, uh, r the rule there, because um, they're doing a movie from Pedro Costa, and within the critical fraternity, at least, he's got a lot of a lot of credit, really, a lot of cachet. Yes, yeah. And uh, the new one they put out second run is Vitalina Varela from 2019. I think it's a fresh release, actually, in this country. It certainly is, yes. And a debut release, yeah. which I don't think they've done in a long time, actually, second run. So that's a nice string to the ball. I think they've they've done some things that haven't been released in this country before because they were banned by the Soviet government after the invasion of Czechoslovakia. But oh, in yeah. terms of things that are like fresh out of the editing room, not so much. 
But this is a... It's funny that we should have it on the same episode as Coco de Coco Da, really. Um, for reasons mm. I will get into in a little bit. But first, the synopsis. Um, as the movie begins, a, there's a, a funeral. Mm. And a little bit further into it, the wife turns up of the the recently deceased man. Yeah. And what follows is... Well, essentially, uh, as it begins, it's uh, the woman who is Vitalina Varela. Mm. Is that self-titled, actually? Uh, yes, it, she plays a character with her own name. Well, that is unusual, yes. That is very unusual, yes. But she plays the, mo- the morning wife, and there's lots of abstract sort of examples of situations that happen when people pass as in uh, people come to visit and in this case they all just stand there while she's doing the the washing and don't say mm-hmm. a word um there's lots of instances like that instances of people who were friends of the husband sort of wandering around uh, delivering prose it's in this area now where it's kind of out of time Mm-hmm. Out of yeah. out of the world, out of sync. Um, and it's also shot in a way which, if you're a fan of Pedro Costa, it will be immediately familiar to you. I mean, it looks it mm. looks gorgeous. Let me be perfectly blunt. Um, but at the same time, it has more of a photographic sensibility than a cinema sensibility. Is in there's a a light source about fifteen meters out of shot, which just yeah. It doesn't make any sense when you think about it in the real world, but visually it's very, very striking and it makes great use out of dark and and light spaces. Mm. Um, So people have really got behind that. Um, But as the story goes on, it's about her sort of reclaiming her her life, becoming more than just the grief of her losing her husband. Mm. And I don't really know... I'll be honest, this is the first time in a long time uh, with a second run title that I'm genuinely a bit confused about how I feel about it. Because this is your first Costa, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty okay with one-of-a-kind singular stylists. Mm. Uh, I mean, I could compare the, the work of Pedro Costa to... Um, Roy Anderson in the sense that Roy Anderson is a guy who basically plants his camera for 5, 10, 15 minute scenes and things just happen Yeah, Read, and, and everything is incredibly dour but in reality mm. it's much, there's, much, there's a great sense of humour to it whereas in this stylistically it's instances of people not saying an awful lot uh, shot in a very photographic way not saying mm. a, a lot, like I said, but it's kind of hard to get into the headspace of, really. I mean, I've heard this described as a great introductory point. Uh, Vitalina Varela is a good introductory what, point. Really? But <laughs> Okay. At the same time, I don't believe this is a director that you can have a good introductory point for. Yeah, I think that there is maybe an argument, as with Terence Malick, that you could go through his work in order because he is one of those directors who only becomes more Pedro Costi. I saw his first film, Blood, mm. which is this weird sort of mashup of things that are quite so almost corny film noir kind of motifs and stuff that's more like this. And over time, he's just cut out the genre elements and focused more ruthlessly on the stuff that he uh, that appeals to him. Um, I, I can, that first one sounds more appealing, I'll be honest. Um, a way mm. I could process this, describe this, is basically it's about setting. Not the setting of the world, it's about yeah. setting of which you watch it. There's movies that mm. work great in, in film festivals with big uh, crowds that get engaged. There's yeah. movies that work in just general cinema viewings. There's movies that work well at home. And there's movies that work well in settings completely divorced from things that you'd usually associate with cinema. In mm. this case, I don't mean this as a term of disparagement, but coming from me, it might it might sound like that. 
but it's a movie which would play very well in an art gallery style setting. Mm, yeah, I know what you mean. Because it, it, the tone of a film is sort of reflected in the setting that you watch it. Because mm. you've got different levels of patience and observance in different settings. Yes, yeah. Um, I'll be honest, it's in watching it at home in front of a TV, it was very difficult. It took two viewings to actually get view it through it, sorry. And this does worry me now, isn't doesn't it, with cinemas reopening and everything being about oh uh, you know, tenants made this much and mm. we've got Wonder Woman coming out. I do hope there is still going to be a space in cinemas for smaller independent movies because as you say you really need to watch this somewhere where you can concentrate on it and nothing else yes I mean, if i was just sat in a darkened room this would be i really got through this in one viewing i'd have no problem mm. with it i'd completely get behind everything it was doing i mean like or dislike i'm not i'm not saying either way but when i've got my computer to one side and I can just walk off, and if it's getting too much of me, yeah, it's very hard to commit to a movie like this. But I say this as somebody who's not really into this style. If you are totally into, mm. if you bought into this director, I don't think anything I've just been talking about for the last five minutes would make the slightest bit of difference, really. Yeah, but yeah, I it's think... it's, a, it's a first time viewing is very very difficult. I think for this guy. I always want to like Pedro Costa a bit more than I do because his style comes from something which I've always championed and I always think is a, a bit of a loss, really, to cinema culture, which is that when that first wave of digital cameras came out, there were so many people looking at them and saying, all right, how do we make this image look like film? And not enough people saying... How do we make an image with this that takes advantage of its digital videoness? Yeah. And you know the the standard Pedro Costa style of image, this small illuminated object in the middle of darkness, just comes from the fact that early digital video was really contrasty, <laughs> and he just worked with that and thought, actually, I like that. Mm. And uh, I love that that happened, but I just find it so hard to get into. Also, I mean, I'd, I'd throw other sort of reference points out as well. Um, he made me think of sort of the, the true, true sort of left, you know, no wave sort of experimentalist of the 1960s. Because mm. he's doing something which is within the, the, the realm of cinema, but it's 100% total experimentation. As far as sort of mainstream thinking? values, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So left where mainstream values are right. Yeah. Uh, nobody, is absolutely nobody doing a film which is even remotely comparable to the things he's, this guy is doing. Mm. So the this person doesn't really have a place to exist in modern cinema. It's just him and his own style, which is why I brought up the, the idea of the art gallery, because it does feel so contrary to what a modern movie is. Yeah. The only person I can think of today who reminds me of him is We Were Sethical. And I suppose that that is a lesson in how personal taste affects your viewpoint on this. Because when I first saw Tropical Malady, I'm not going to lie, I couldn't unpick the whole thing the first time I saw it. But I thought, I have no idea what that all just meant. But I found watching it such a sensory pleasure yeah. that I do not care. And with Costa's style, I just do not get that immediate hit of attraction to the image that he's putting forward. And it makes me less minded to kind of sift through and try and work out what he's, you know, driving at. Then. It, it, well, how was the word I was thinking of? Um, it puts you in time of a trance when, you, when one yeah. of these movies really, really hits. You just sort of lose yourself yeah. and you're transported to a total other place um, entirely, which is, I think, it goes back to where I, I was talking about um, the location of where you watch a film like this. Cause mm, I, yes. I don't believe you can truly get lost watching it in front of your TV. Um, mm. Which is a shame for like a home video release, but 
again, it's it's about where you watch it. You can take your Blu-ray and watch it wherever you want. You know, but for me, I, I don't think this guy is really going to click. Unfortunately, and Vitalina Varela <laughs> didn't really help. It's kind of very obtuse in every single way. Should we hijack a cinema? Would that be a way to sort this problem out? We'd have to make it look like something which isn't a cinema, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> have to be a sensory deprivation box where it's just you and a wall playing this. <laughs> That's it. One of those isolation tanks that rich people used to obsess over in the 90s, just with like a little iPhone strapped to the roof of it playing this. That's the that's the cinema now. <laughs> yes, I feel horrible. Sort of, I mean, basically talking a lot of bad about this movie, but at the end of the day, it's just right place, right time, right frame frame of mind. That's what it all comes down to. I think you you cannot make a movie that takes as many risks as this and have it uniformly sort of beloved. Oh, no. And I'm sure that Costa is aware of that. I just, uh, yeah, I kind of wish that I was on the Bob Dylan side rather than the Mr. Jones side of this argument. Yes, but if anything like uh, we talked about in the past couple of minutes has really appealed to you, I would recommend at least trying it. Maybe not this one, maybe one of his less difficult movies and in building up to this, but you know, it's not like we're totally throwing it under the bus, this movie, at any means. No way, shape or form. Uh, yeah, I, I think Costa's work has genuine worth and it is unquestionably innovative. And that is out now on second run Blu-ray and I think DVD too. Out at the cinemas next week, uh, we've got a couple of interesting reissues. We've got the reissue of what I think... It, it, at one point, it was your favourite Bong Joon Ho. I don't know if it still is now. Memories of Murder. Can't I just say all of them are my favourite? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it's the old Paul Thomas Anderson problem again. I mean, you've got seven movies, and five of them are my favourite. So what? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've got another issue, 25th anniversary reissue of Lahan, the film that brought Vincent Cassell to prominence. I remember watching that so, so long ago at the height of DVD and loving it. It'd be interesting to watch it and, and figure out whether it holds up. Definitely, yeah. Uh, we've got Real, a new British indie romance directed by Aki Omashibi with Pippa Bennett Warner and Amy Manson among the cast. Great that things like that get a chance at the cinema as well. I don't think it serves all films yes. well to be done on uh, on VOD. Completely, yeah, yeah. Uh, in in similar, uh, <laughs> similar fashion, if anyone has three hours to spare and far too much faith in human nature, you could go and see The Painted Bird, Vaclav <laughs> Mahul's adaptation of Jerzy Kosminski's classic Holocaust novel, which... Again, I'm pretty sure we have a review of coming up on the site from Mark fairly soon. I might be wrong. The early there. gist is basically, if you watch Come and Say it and you think, hmm, I want some more of that. <laughs> well, <laughs> now the painted bird is, is catering to you. Uh, and finally, a sort of big-ish new release. I think this will be on uh, multiplexes, although it might have fell through the cracks in normal circumstances, but Sally Potter's new film, The Road's Not Taken, uh, which has a very fine cast, Javier Bardem, Elle Fanning, Laura Linney and Salma Hayek, hmm. uh, which will be out at some multiplex locations. I, again, as with Costa, I always kind of want to like a new Sally Potter film a bit more than I do, but I do love that she is still out there doing her thing. I don't thing. think I've actually seen anything from her. Maybe I have, maybe I have. Orlando is the great one. Orlando is the... If there's one you absolutely must see, it's Orlando, because it's it's Tilda Swinton playing a several hundred-year-old person who can change gender at will. I mean, it's, it, if ever someone was born for a role... <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't a role, they just followed her and that's just what happened, you know. <laughs> yes! 
so yeah, that's all out next week. And I, I think we are going to do Lahan, aren't we? Uh, it's nice to look back at these films. It's weird when you get like big yeah. like, anniversaries within your lifetime. Yeah, but it's just mm. one of those things, I guess. It happens more and more as the years go by. I certainly will be very enthusiastic to look back on it. Um, but yes, that's until next week with Lahan. That's been your lot from Cinema Eclectica. I've been Graham. And I've been Rob. See you next week. Thank you.